Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at Air Atlanta of the United States, not to be confused with Air Atlanta Icelandic of, well, Iceland. Okay, I need to get this out of the way first. I've never needed to mention the race or ethnicity of anyone during an episode of Grounded. Sometimes it might be relevant, such as the Iraqi businessman who set up Air Scotland using another airline he established in Greece, but generally I see it as something that's irrelevant. Also, being from the United Kingdom, this is sort of a new thing. I've never seen it as an issue before, and more importantly, over here we say things a bit differently, so I'm going to try and keep it more aligned for my American viewers, given that it was an American airline. The reason I bring this up is that Air Atlanta was the first airline in the United States owned and run by minorities, with the founder and a number of key investors being African American. Again, I only mention it as it's a rather key milestone, and to not mention it would frankly be doing those involved a huge disservice. Now. Back to the scheduled program. The origins of Air Atlanta go back to the late 1970s when up and coming attorney Michael Hollis saw an opportunity to take advantage of the impending Airline Deregulation Act and form his own airline. To quote Hollis, I grew up here and aviation is a big part of Atlanta, adding that the airport is almost like the heart of Atlanta. He had no aviation background, his father had been a Pullman porter on the railroads and his mother had worked for the Atlanta Housing Authority, but both had instilled a drive for educational excellence which had led Hollis on his road to success. It was during his time as a political science major at Dartmoor College that Hollis became interested in transportation, particularly the BART system in San Francisco and the MARTA system being developed in Atlanta. Whilst at Dartmoor, he met a prominent Washington lawyer who specialised in aviation, who gave him some insight into the industry. Shortly after graduating from Dartmoor, Hollis was named by President Jimmy Carter as Associate Chief Counsel of the President's Commission on the Accident at Three Mile Island. Following this, he spent two years in New York City working for Oppenheimer, who was setting up a public finance department. This experience taught him valuable lessons about structuring deals. He also had the opportunity to run his airline idea by his colleagues, and with the Carter administration pushing more and more for deregulation, it helped him consider his plan more seriously. Hollis returned to Atlanta in 1981 and set about turning his airline dreams into reality. With help from Maynard Jackson, who was serving his first term as mayor of Atlanta, Hollis was introduced to Robert L. White, president of the National Alliance of Federal and Postal Employees, a largely black union whose pension fund provided the first $500,000 in seed capital for the airline. Mayor Jackson would also introduce Hollis to William J. Kennedy III, chairman of the black-owned North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company and of UNC Ventures Inc., a Boston concern that invests in minority-owned businesses. North Carolina Mutual would invest nearly $2.5 million in Air Atlanta. UNC Ventures, in addition to providing $2.75 million for Air Atlanta, helped enlist Equitable, whose real estate unit had extensive commercial real estate investments in the city and would also invest $2.5 million into the new airline. Air Atlanta started to take shape during the tail end of 1983. The airline's first four aircraft were added to their books in December 1983 with the fifth following in January. The five Boeing 727 trijets were leased from General Electric and had previously been in service with United Airlines since the mid to late 1960s. They were the original 100 series model, but due to a quirk with the Boeing numbering system they were classed as 727-22s, which I'll admit confused me a little at first. One additional aircraft, formerly with PSA, was also delivered in January. This was a 200 series model which was larger than the other five, so it was decided in the interest of keeping a standardised fleet that the aircraft be moved on without ever seeing service with the airline. The five remaining aircraft would receive the rather smart Air Atlanta livery, consisting of a grey belly and white roof, with three cheat lines, orange, red and purple, running the length of the fuselage. Air Atlanta intended on going after the business traveller, offering a premium service for an economy price. The airline adopted the slogan, Born to Serve Business. Their 1984 television ad quite literally emphasised this, with an Air Atlanta 727 hatching from an egg. The aircraft, originally fitted with 129 seats, were reconfigured with 88 seat cabins giving passengers plenty of legroom. It was an odd configuration though, a 2 plus 2 forward cabin with the rest of the aircraft in a 2 plus 3 layout. Inside the terminal at Atlanta's Hartsfield Airport, the airline had specially arranged facilities. 
Directly across from the airline's check-in desks was a special security screening area and Air Atlanta's Gate Express Transportation, which would whisk passengers to the airline's own gate area. Air Atlanta called this its Gateside Lounge, where passengers were offered complimentary tea and coffee, light refreshments, newspapers and courtesy telephones. There was also a roll-on valet, where passengers who had brought an extra suit could hang it up and it would be rolled into the aircraft and loaded into the wardrobe. This special arrangement meant that passengers could check in as little as 10 minutes before departure if they so wished, impossible to do nowadays, even with a private jet. Well, I'm guessing there is, I've never had the pleasure of one. Once on board, the in-flight meals were freshly prepared and served on proper crockery with silverware and no plastic in sight. Air Atlanta took to the skies on the 4th of February 1984 with flights from Atlanta to New York's Kennedy Airport as well as Memphis, Tennessee. Miami would follow quickly with service beginning that April. Crucially, as the airline was forming, Air Atlanta had signed an agreement with Pan American World Airways to operate cold shower flights under the Pan Am Express umbrella. This allowed Pan Am passengers to connect onto Air Atlanta flights to and from the large Pan Am hubs in New York and Miami. Air Atlanta would use the iconic Pan Am Worldport at JFK, offering a near seamless connection to other Pan Am flights. It wasn't just Pan Am who had made a deal with Air Atlanta. Both Eastern and Delta Airlines had made interline agreements with the little startup thanks to personal appeals from Air Atlanta's founder, Michael Hollis, to both Frank Borman of Eastern and Dave Garrett of Delta. This was a big deal, as Eastern were well established in Atlanta at the time, and Delta's been at Atlanta's hometown airline since 1941. It was very shrewd of Hollis to get the two huge competitors to agree to cooperate with, rather than crush the tiny airline. April saw Air Atlanta try to go public with an initial public offering of 1 million shares of stock. The airline intended on raising $22 million, however, it seemed that there wasn't much interest and so the offering was withdrawn. Founder and chairman Michael Hollis was forced to seek further funding from his initial investors and to his credit managed to raise $25 million in additional funding. Air Atlanta would plod on through 1984 and into 1985, seeing the introduction of flights to LaGuardia Airport along the way, meaning Air Atlanta was now serving two of New York's main airports. This route was short-lived, however, as it was dropped by October, with the airline focusing entirely on JFK. During the winter of 1985, Air Atlanta would stick to its three routes, Memphis, Miami and New York, but January 1986 would bring the start of the airline's expansion. Several new routes were added, including Philadelphia, Orlando and Tampa. These routes were easily squeezed into the schedule, but with even more destinations lined up, the airline needed to bring in more aircraft, lest be caught short. The first of several more Boeing 727s arrived in May 1986, another ex-United 100 series which had spent some time with Korean Air, and a further 727 was delivered in August, this one a former South African Airways machine. Air Atlanta had reportedly been losing an average of $500,000 a month since its launch and the airline needed to find a way of boosting its finances without going cap in hand once again to its investors. The Florida market was a rather successful one for the airline, with Air Atlanta serving Miami, Orlando and Tampa. When Orlando had been introduced with free flights a day to Atlanta, it became the airline's third most important market behind Atlanta and Miami. In just under seven months, around 15,000 passengers had flown Air Atlanta from Orlando. This was despite a minuscule market share of around half a percent, and in order to milk the route for all it was worth, added a fourth daily flight. By September, Air Atlanta had introduced flights to Fort Myers, via Tampa, and Greenbrier, with the latter seeing its flight continue on to New York, giving it a non-stop service from Atlanta and New York. The inclusion of Greenbrier was notable as it coincided with the arrival of a new investor in Air Atlanta, CSX. The CSX Corporation are best known for being a large railroad company, however, at the time they were also of the owner of the Greenbrier Resort, a large hotel now known for its nuclear bunker designed to house Congress as part of Project Greek Island. CSX invested in Air Atlanta after Michael Hollis was introduced to various CSX officials with the help of Atlanta Mayor Andrew Young. Questions were asked at the time regarding this investment, with several suggestions that it was political, given that CSX wanted to build a rail cargo facility in a depressed and largely black area of southwest Atlanta, and of course, the Mayor's involvement. 
Carl Norman, the Vice President of Finance for CSX, said in an interview that while Hollis's relationship with the mayor might have gotten him in the door, it was a matter of economics, adding that the decision was helped by Air Atlanta's agreement to operate a flight between Atlanta and CSX's Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia. In November 1986, three more Boeing 727s arrived. Two of these were the larger 200 series model, with the third being a 100 series. The 100 was brought in to replace the former South African 727 which had been operating during the summer. Two of the three aircraft had previously operated with Pride Air, who were an employee-owned airline based in New Orleans which collapsed after just three months in the air. I covered Pride Air back in episode 30, so if you've not seen it, why not go and check it out? December 1986 saw an increase in services from Atlanta to Philadelphia with some flights continuing on to New York, giving the airline a bit more reach from the Big Apple. Detroit joined the ever-growing route network with two flights a day during the week and one on Saturday and Sunday. New Orleans was introduced in February 1987 with three flights a day during the week and two at weekends. Despite this expansion and the outward appearance of an airline on the up and up, things would unravel very quickly for Air Atlanta, with the airline beginning the year with debts of around $55 million. In January, the airline was forced to sell one of its 727s in a quick attempt at raising funds, but it wasn't enough. By early March, Air Atlanta had sold its gates and landing slots at Washington National Airport to Pan Am in order to raise $2 million, of which $1.5 million went straight out to pay overdue bills. Air Atlanta was struggling badly. It was now selling assets in order to keep going and that was a slippery slope. In mid-March, the Air Atlanta executives held crisis talks with the investors in an attempt to avoid bankruptcy. Things were so bad for Air Atlanta that just minutes before a 5pm deadline passed, the airline was able to make a payment of $50,000 against the $365,000 it owed in landing and rental fees to the city of Atlanta. This was really bad. If they'd failed to make that payment, they were almost certainly going to be held in default and evicted from their central hub and would have killed the airline off instantly. Just days after this, one of the aircraft leasing companies came knocking on Air Atlanta's door demanding two of their aircraft back. After being assured that new investment was days away, the lessers departed without their aircraft, but it was another very close call for the airline. It looked like there was some hope for Air Atlanta as the airline executives held talks with KLM, the Dutch national airline. KLM was prepared to invest $10 million in Air Atlanta, providing that the airline's existing investors match it with $10 million of their own. This would give Air Atlanta some much needed breathing room. Unfortunately, Air Atlanta's investors, who had already collectively sunk $83 million into the airline by now, refused to bankroll Air Atlanta any further. With the KLM deal dead in the water and no further investors lined up, Air Atlanta filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection and suspended operations on Friday the 3rd of April 1987 with all 700 employees laid off. Air Atlanta planned to use Chapter 11 to allow it to reorganise and hopefully find an investor willing to help the airline get back out of bankruptcy. The airline looked at the possibility of resuming operations with the smaller and more fuel-efficient Boeing 737s. However, these were a very sought-after type and not easy to get hold of, especially on the cheap. It seemed, however, that Air Atlanta had shot itself in the foot by suspending operations, as it soon faced the prospect of forfeiting its slots at JFK, as per their Use Them or Lose Them policy. With the prospects of losing its slots, some of Air Atlanta's creditors demanded that they be sold off immediately, while others insisted they were crucial to any attempt at restarting the airline. The Air Atlanta executives had been in talks with the Texas Air Corporation, owners of Continental Airlines, People Express, Frontier and Eastern Airlines. The TAC had been interested in acquiring what was left of Air Atlanta, with founder Michael Hollis travelling to Houston to try and negotiate a deal. Unfortunately, the suspension of services had rendered the airline almost completely worthless and the talks come to nothing. By the end of May, the airline's creditors forced the company to begin Chapter 7 liquidation proceedings and Air Atlanta was grounded, permanently. So, what went wrong? Well, the answer is that Air Atlanta was undercapitalized from the start. This immediately put them on the back foot, as once they started operating, they found themselves losing money from the off. The airline was so short on cash that they often bartered unsold seats for everything from office supplies to newspaper advertising space. The situation was made worse by Air Atlanta's business plan. 
To offer a full service comparable to that of business class but at a coach price was one thing, but to do this with reduced capacity was asking for trouble. If Fair Atlanta had been charging a premium for this level of service, then it stood a chance of breaking even, maybe even making a profit. Air Atlanta needed a load factor of 50% in order to break even, but despite having a lower number of seats on each aircraft, the load factor was as low as 32.2%. It gradually rose to 44% and eventually peaked at 62% in the airline's final months. It's worth noting that Midwest Express began commercial flights around the same time with a very similar premise but was profitable from the off. That said, Midwest Express was operating out of Milwaukee, which at the time was lacking in competition unlike Air Atlanta, who were in Delta's hometown. The two airlines also had different fleets. Midwest Express operated the smaller Douglas DC-9 twin jet, as opposed to the free-engine Boeing 727s used by Air Atlanta. By using the Boeing 727, Air Atlanta would have a higher fuel bill and higher maintenance costs, which in turn would eat into their margins. Margins which were already quite tight given the airline's expenditure on its high service levels. It's worth pointing out that Air Atlanta had a loyal and very hard working workforce. This was despite having pay levels considerably lower than competing airlines. For example, Eastern and Delta were paying their pilots over $100,000 per year, but at Air Atlanta, pilots were paid around $44,000. Some flight attendants were paid just $11,000 a year, and that's despite the need to offer a much higher level of service on board. In other words, run round a lot more and work harder than crews at other airlines. The employees all wanted the airline to be a success, and they were prepared to work hard for it. While Air Atlanta had a very loyal and hard-working workforce, there were a few issues higher up the chain of command. In its three years of operations, Air Atlanta went through four presidents and almost as many vice presidents and CEOs. The first change came just months after beginning operations, when Rodan A. Brandt resigned as president and chief executive officer. He was replaced by Ronald V. Sapp, who took over the role in an acting capacitor, and returned to his normal position of vice president and chief financial officer, following the appointment of Neil M. Effman, formerly senior VP with Transworld Airlines in November 1984, just nine months after taking to the skies. Part of the problem with the executive turnover was Michael Hollis himself. Three of his top management team resigned in July 1984 in protest at some of his policies and behaviour. Those include the President and Chief Executive, the Vice President of Operations and the Vice President of Marketing. They were upset that Hollis interfered with the running of the airline, believing that they had an agreement in which he would stick to being the face of the company and working on attracting investors. The difference in age and experience of Hollis and his executives also led to friction. Hollis was now in his early 30s with zero airline experience, but his executives were nearly twice his age and with a wealth of experience. This led to clashes whenever Hollis would interfere with the running of the airline. They were also unhappy that Hollis and his friends flew first class when the company policy required the staff to fly coach. They also complained when he set up an expensively appointed office at the airport whilst keeping a second office and secretary in the city. The dissident executives said that Hollis was setting a bad example, especially considering the low wages the rest of the staff were on compared to the competition. Going back to the financial problems with the airline, when Michael Hollis was pitching to various investors to get Air Atlanta off the ground, he was looking for around $50 million in startup capital but fell well short. In the end, he raised around half of that and still pressed ahead getting Air Atlanta into the skies with the hope of raising further funds by going public. Unfortunately, the timing was wrong for an IPO. It was early 1984 and several young post-deregulation airlines had already collapsed, with the most recent one being Pacific Express, who ceased operations that February. Air Florida, the airline lauded as the deregulation success story, was also on its last legs, hanging on for dear life as the inevitable approached. With Air Florida's imminent collapse and the failure of several other young airlines, it was hard to find willing investors, except for, of course, those who'd already invested in Air Atlanta. The failed IPO saw Hollis repeatedly go cap in hand to the airline's existing investors and ask for more. Unlike in Oliver Twist, however, Hollis was given more, and Air Atlanta would end up squeezing around $83 million from its investors during its short life. Hollis was a very impressive figure. He was able to get quite a lot of high-profile people behind him, and while some have criticised the involvement of two Atlanta mayors to help him get introduced to some folks, surely it is acceptable for a mayor to help a local business out, 
within reason of course. That said, following his stint as Mayor of Atlanta, Maynard Jackson secured himself a place on the Air Atlanta board. I'd have said that looks a bit dodgy, but it seems a regular occurrence that politicians end up on the boards of companies they've helped out. Besides, it couldn't have been that dodgy, as he was re-elected a few years later and even got the airport named after him. Regardless of how he got through the door, it was Hollis himself that made all the deals. When it all went south, there was a glimmer of hope, with the Dutch national airline KLM offering Air Atlanta a lifeline. This was complicated, however. The obvious stumbling block was of course that KLM would invest $10 million providing that Air Atlanta's less than willing investors matched it with another $10 million of their own. Another issue was that KLM wanted to include Air Atlanta flights on their reservation system and offer code shares and through ticketing, something which is perfectly normal now but not so simple back in the mid 80s. Unlike today where the aviation industry has been opened up, first by the Bermuda and Bermuda 2 agreements between the UK and US, and now the EU-US Open Skies Agreement. Back then there was no such agreement in place between the United States and the Netherlands. This was a considerable problem, but it was hoped that Michael Hollis himself would be able to use his political contacts to get negotiations underway. Unfortunately, politics is a slow game, too slow for Air Atlanta, and combined with the reluctance of investors to pump more money into the airline and match KLM's offer, the deal collapsed. The negotiations with Texas Air which followed the collapsed KLM deal would have been for the remaining scraps of the airline rather than saving Air Atlanta itself. Given the airline was now grounded with no staff, a few leased aircraft and a handful of slots, it was pretty much worthless and the negotiations came to naught. To be fair, had something come of it then the likely outcome would have been that Air Atlanta would have been absorbed into Eastern or, on the other hand, Given Frank Lorenzo and his issues with Eastern, he may have moved some Eastern operations into Air Atlanta. Sadly, we'll never know. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions or criticisms, please do get in touch. If you don't have a YouTube doodah, don't worry. I've got a contact form on my website and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I have plenty more episodes in the works, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land? And as always, thanks for watching.